the 19th of Psalms. And this is a Psalm of David. And he's writing here primarily in praise of the Word of God. And so we've titled the message, The Wonder of the Word. Now, he begins the first uh, six verses here to talk about how God reveals himself through creation. And then he says, that was elementary. God re really revealed himself through his word. And so look at it. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Now he's saying that as you look at creation, and you see the stars, and you see day and night, and you see all these things, you must say, who created this? I mean, this is such a marvelous, wonderful creation. Somebody made this. It didn't just happen. You don't have a creation without a creator. And so he said, day unto day, and everywhere in the world this is seen, so that people are without excuse, because wherever you live in the world, there's day and night, and you see all the glory of creation, and you are actually, you can't help yourself. You say, this is absolutely marvelous and wonderful. To think of the creation and to think of all the glory and the beauty of it. I, I suggest to everyone to uh, study some flowers and see the gorgeous beauty and the color of flowers. And uh, look, at this time of the year, when you uh, look at the leaves turning, and it's just all inspiring when you see that. Or if you get a chance to be where you can see the sun rise and the sun set and the clouds and all the beauty of the skies, and, and if you can get into a forest and see some uh, waterfalls, and, and how can you not say, glory to God, there's a creator behind this creation. And so he said, their line is gone through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which as, is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Talking about the sun coming up. And he said, his going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit is unto the ends of it. And uh, there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. And wherever you go, the heat of the sun is there. And, and, and it's just a marvelous thing as you study creation. And, uh, you know, the Bible is a book of science. Yeah, whenever God says something about science, it's scientifically true. Scientists have been wrong in so many cases, and science constantly changes, science falsely so-called. As an example, you all know that at one time, the scientific minds said that the earth was flat. And the Bible, as all the time, talked about the circle of the earth and the circuit of it, and uh, that it's a ball, and, and we see it, and the Bible taught it. The Bible was always right. Science was wrong. Medical science at one time drained people's blood. They call it bloodletting because they thought that was what would make people get well. They taught that all the disease was in the blood and they let a little out and they'd try to get better. And if it didn't get better, let a little more out. And, uh, and uh, they tell us in history that that's one of the reasons George Washington died earlier than he should have because they were using bloodletting and they let enough blood out that he got weak and wasn't able to overcome the weakness of the flesh and died. And so that, that was the best of medical science. But the Bible taught the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so the Bible is always true. And uh, you read these things about creation, and you say, wow, all creation teaches us that there is a mighty God. Don't you love that song, Oh, Lord, my God? Oh, that song that, uh, uh, that we have sung here, and it's, uh, When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the roaring thunder. Ah, Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Well, that's absolutely true. And, uh, and you know, the greatest scientists that we've ever had in this world 
were believers in the Bible. And Newton and some of these others who, who actually discovered so many great and wonderful things, they believed the Bible was absolutely so, and they followed the teaching of the Word of God. And uh, those who rejected the Word made some terrible mistakes and came to the wrong conclusions. And so the Bible teaches us that God is the creator and sustainer of the whole universe. But now go down to verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Now let's review that for a moment and uh, see as the Lord has given it to us. He's given us step by step by step. And we'll just look at it and see what it is. He's teaching us here the words work. What does the word do? Well, the very first thing it does is the thing that's most needed by every person on the face of the earth, and that's salvation. And so he starts with that. And he said, the word of the Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And uh, it brings salvation. And, and, you know, the Bible says it's perfect. Now, when he says it's perfect, what he means is there's absolutely no errors in the Bible. The Bible is inerrant. And it is infallible. It's incapable of being wrong. If the Bible states it, it's absolutely true. Men have been trying for hundreds and hundreds of years to disprove the Bible, and every one of them fall flat on their face because the Bible is absolutely true in every way. It's perfect in every way. You can't improve on perfection. And all these new people coming out with their new Bibles and all that been is trying to improve on. It's perfect. You don't need any one of these perverted things that are coming out now. And, and there, everyone who believes something can come out with a Bible and say, well, here, I'm going to print my own Bible and prove what I say is true. We got now homosexual Bibles coming out. We got now uh, transgender Bibles coming out. We have now people who are taking all the genders out of the Bible. And everybody is an it or a them or a they instead of he or she or him. And there's no longer a father. There's no longer a mother. And yet that's absolutely foolish. And you can't improve on perfection. The word of God is perfect. That's what he says. Forever, O Lord, thy word is set in heaven. And so notice it, he says, the first thing this perfect word does is converts the soul. Now, aren't you glad that you're converted? Aren't you glad you've been saved? Well, that came from the word. Because the Bible says you are begotten by the word. You are brought to new life by the word. And the Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but it's the power of God, the salvation to everyone that believeth. And the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the, so the Bible is perfect converting the soul. Nobody gets saved until they hear the word. You can't be saved unless you know what the Bible teaches about you being lost. And what the Bible teaches about all your perfect works of yourself are foolishness. And uh, they are not in any way acceptable to God. That you have to come to him as a sinner and put your faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. You had to put your confidence in Christ. And the word of God is perfect, converting the soul. I can't ever get over that because, you know... It's my privilege to talk to people about the Savior. And I go out looking uh, through the week and uh, I always carry my little green book around with me. Uh, and if I eat something, I leave it. And I, I try to get a chance to talk to the waitresses or waiters and, and try to talk to people about the Savior wherever I go. And, and what I like about this, it says on here, select verses from the Holy Bible. And uh, I want to give you some verses out of the Bible. Would you, would you let me do that? Yeah, I'll let you do that. And so uh, it gives you an opportunity because the word of the Lord will bring salvation to the sinner. And uh, Jesus said, search the word for in them, you, the scriptures for in them, you think you have eternal life. And there they which testify of me. And the Bible said uh, that uh, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And we study the word of God because the entrance of thy word gives light. And, and, the, and the Bible says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way 
by taking heed thereto according to thy word, O Lord. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Oh, the preciousness of the word of God, it brings salvation. It converts the soul. Now look at the second point the Lord gives us. He said, uh, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, not only do you get salvation, but you get wisdom from the word because the word is absolutely sure. Uh, the philosophers of this world are constantly changing. And uh, they have one idea and another idea. Did you know there's no one theory of evolution? There must be 25 or 30 theories of revolu evolution. And, uh, and they change constantly because it's all false. There's a creator and he created it in six days. Take your Bible, believe what the book says, and you're okay. You're scientifically true. I mean, those who teach evolution, which theory are you talking about? And they disagree with each other and fight among themselves. And why do they do that? Because they're nothing sure. But the word of God is sure, making wise the simple. And you know something? You can be wise. Now, you have to admit that you don't have that knowledge of your own, and you have to admit that you need that knowledge. But did you know the Bible says, the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Did you get that? For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. What's that mean? Well, he breathed the word. He gave the word. And so, where do you get wisdom? Wisdom comes from the word. And he said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that doubteth is like a wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so he said, you need something sure. You don't need something where you can be double-minded. Maybe this, maybe this. No, no. You get to the sure word of God, and you can have wisdom. You can be wise. In fact, the writer said over in uh, Psalm 119, he said, because I've received your word, I'm wiser than my teacher's. Did you know, I, I was saved when I was just young. I was 12 years old. Called to preach when I was 13. And, and so I began to study the Word and, and, and memorize the Word, the Word of God. And, and so I was in a science class. And, and in the science class, the teacher said one day, well, when men stood up off of all four and became erect, then, he, then we moved forward in society. And I, I, could not, I could not hold myself clear. I mean, I had to say something. Because at that point, I was wiser than the teacher, believe me. Because I believed the book. So I said to the teacher, I said, what does that mean when man got off of all four and stood up? Do you mean that you think it's that men sometimes walked around on all four? And the teacher was a professed Christian, turned red in his face, and I didn't mean to embarrass him. I really didn't. I, I, but it just overcame me. I could have been teaching this false bunch of garbage there in the classroom as if it were science. And so I said, he said, Brother Strickland, you're right. He said, you're absolutely right. Man never walked down on all fours. He, God created him. He said, I'm, I apologize to the class for saying that. And, and I, I appreciated Coach Hoffman. He was the science teacher. I appreciated him for his admitting that. But you see, the Word of God will make you wiser than this old wicked world around you. It makes wise the simple. And, and then look at the next thing it says. It says, uh, the statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. Did you ever get miserable? Did you ever get depressed? Did you ever get depression? But you know what? The Word of God is right. Everything, other things are not right, but the Word of God is righteous. It's right by God's standard of right. God's very essence, His very nature is righteousness. Every, that's where we get all of our laws and everything. It comes from God's righteousness. God is the one who said it. And He gives the standard of what's right and wrong. And, and He's saying the Bible, the Word of God is written according to His righteousness. And if you'll follow that, you'll have some rejoicing in your heart. And so when you get that depression, when you get all down, get 
out the Word and start reflecting on the Word. Read the Word. Pray the Word into your heart. And the Word of God will do something. It rejoices the heart. Man, I'm telling you, it'll put pep in your step. It'll make you feel good. You get the Word of God. That's what he said. And now look at number four. There's four things here it says that the Word of God will do. This is the work of the Word. And he said, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And that is, it, it will instruct you, it will teach you how to live. That means what he says, enlighten the eyes, he's talking about giving you direction for your life. Did you ever find the place where you wondered what you ought to do next? Well, get the Word of God and read the Bible and saturate your mind and heart in the Word, and God will begin to give you direction, and you learn, like for instance, over in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, where he said, you know, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Do you see it? He shall direct you. That's what he's saying here. He said he'll enlighten your eyes. He'll tell you the right way to go. And you'll be hearing him say in your heart, this is the way, walk you in it. And you guide your life, precept upon precept, line upon line. God will give you direction on how to live. Whoa, the work of the word. Now, now let's look again. Look, look at the worth of the word. In verse 9, look, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Now you learn something about it. Here is the worth, uh, the, the worth of the word. That is, it's eternal. Every word of man will pass away. And, uh, you know, they had to put out new textbooks every year because they're making new discoveries and make the old discoveries false. Now, I don't know how many of you were in school when you learned that Pluto was a planet. Did you learn that? Did you learn that Pluto was a planet? Did you know the new textbooks say, no, it's not a planet at all? It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a heavenly body, but it's not a planet. Did you know that? That's what I say. Now the new textbooks say that, that it's not a planet. You thought it was, didn't you? See, you were fooled. You were fooled by textbooks and they constantly change. They do. And if you study world geography, that's constantly changing. I mean, we thought we knew the nations of the world at one time. We memorized all the nations of Africa and all that thing, and, and we knew where they were. Uh, but, you know, you can't do that now because they've changed so much. And things change all around the world. Uh, but the Word of God's eternal, enduring forever. Aren't you glad that's so? The word is settled forever. Now look at the second thing about it. The judgments of the Lord are true, righteous, true and righteous altogether. Not in part true and righteous, but altogether true and righteous. If God said it, it's so. You can absolutely stake your life on it. The word of God is true. It is absolute. It is indefensible. It is absolutely undefeatable. It is eternal and it is true and righteous altogether. Every part of it. Now, there have been some who have come along and said, state, made statements like this. Well, the Bible contains the Word of God. Now, that sounds sweet, doesn't it? The Bible contains the Word of God. But that's totally false. The Bible is the Word of God. And when you say the Bible contains the Word of God, well, what part of it is His Word and what part of it is something else? Why? No, the Bible is the Word of God. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, it is the Word of God. And sometimes he quotes the devil, but when he quotes him, he tells the truth, exactly what the devil said. When he quotes others, he quotes it true. It is true and righteous altogether. There's absolutely nothing corrupt in the Word of God. And then notice something else about the worth of it. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. The Word of God is more precious than all the money in the world. If you had all the money in the world and you did not have a Bible, you would have no knowledge 
of the goodness and grace of God and salvation in Christ and forgiveness of sin and all of the wonderful truths, if you didn't have the Word of God, all the money in the world would be worthless. The Word of God is more precious than the most gold and the finest gold you could ever have. And we must not be as some who sell out the Word of God for money. They would rather have money than to have the Word of God. Oh, don't ever make that's a bad bargain. I heard Dr. John McCormick one time uh, say that uh, when he was just a young fellow, he was saved and called to preach, and, and uh, he was just excited about it. But he wanted the Bible so bad. And he really just wanted a Bible. And, and it seems like that he was going to buy, buy a Bible for just, uh, say, four, three or four dollars. And uh, when he got there, somehow they raised the price on it. And, and, and he was cheated. But he said, I raised the money and got my Bible. He said, that guy was cheated. I, I, got, I got the treasure. Uh, I got something worth more than all the gold and silver in this world. And uh, from that time, he began to memorize and teach and preach the Word of God. One of the greatest Bible teachers I've ever had uh, through the years. I look at something else about the Word, the worth of it. It is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. You know, when you start reading the Word and start studying it, and, uh, and you let it fill your heart and soul, and you spend time with it, ah, uh, it gets sweet. The Word of God is so precious, and it is precious, and you read it, and you find out something. If you haven't found out how precious the Word is, you haven't been spending enough time in it. I mean, I'm serious. The Bible says, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. But if you've tasted of the Lord, that He is precious, and He is sweet, and, and it's good for you. And if you read the Word and spend time in the Word, well, once in a while, the Lord will just send you a little nugget, and you say, whoo, boy, isn't that good? Uh, and uh, we were sitting at the table today, just as an example. This week, I was studying for the message, the morning message, and, and I noticed uh, the word gnash, gnash on you, uh, you know, the gnash, uh, and, and in hell, uh, he's talking about there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And, and I began to think about, what does that really mean? And so I, I got uh, concordance out and I began to read every place in the Bible uh, where the word occurs and I found out what it meant. And what it means is to gnash at somebody with, with meanness in your heart. And in hell, people gnash upon each other. It's not going to be any uh, happiness in hell. Somebody said, well, you know, when I get to hell, I'll have all my friends. No, you'll be gnashing at each other and grasping at each other and hating one another uh, and because you're in that torment. Well, see, when, when I saw that, I said, wow, I've never seen that before. That's a marvelous thing. It's wonderful. That excites me when you see something like that. And I've been at it for a lot of years. But His Word is still precious. And you get into this thing, and you see the worth of the Word. Now, I want you to see the warning of the Word. Uh, look in verse uh, number 10, number 11. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. Here's the warning of the Word. And the Bible says, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. He's warning us now of several things. Notice, first of all, he said, thy servant is warned of judgment. God's judgment's real. And folk, Christians ought to have the fear of God. You know, a reverential fear. Because the Lord chastens his people, and if we walk away from the Lord and won't listen to him, he'll chasten us, he'll spank us, and uh, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's written, by the way, in the, in the context of Christians. And, and did you know, we ought to have the fear of the Lord because the Bible said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, and the Lord teaches us his fear. The fear of the Lord is clean. And, and he teaches us to, uh, to guide us and to warn us not to make 
mistakes, not to have errors, not to fall away from the Lord in disbelief. More to be desired they, he said, than silver or gold. Then he says, we're warned in keeping of them. There's great reward. Who can understand his errors? How are you going to understand them unless you get in the Word? The Word teaches you of your errors. And you know it's possible for any person to have errors in their life. It's, it's possible for you to misunderstand what somebody said. It's possible. I, I, I've been knowledgeable of that for a, a lot of years. And, and uh, I try to preach using words that everybody understands. And not use 60 cent words and, uh, that impress people, but they don't know what they mean. And, and I try to make the Word of God so clear that everyone can understand what it means and, and uh, take it home with them and put it in shoe leather. And that's my responsibility because he tells me that it's possible that people can make errors. And I have had it happen. I have preached and someone misunderstood the meaning of what I preached. And, then, uh, and they would ask me later. And, and what they understood from it was not what was taught. But they heard something different because perhaps of their background or perhaps the experiences they've had or perhaps their education or whatever. And I had to re-explain it. Well, the Word of God will warn us against errors. And we have to look and make sure that we are guiding our lives by the Word of God, that we're not making mistakes. And uh, he said, uh, he, uh, we understand our errors, and then cleanse us from secret faults. And then notice what he said, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. You know what he's talking about here? Beloved, what he's saying is, we are saved by grace. We understand that, don't we? Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Not works and, and all the works of the flesh, baptism and all the good works and all that has no power to wash sins away. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, that cleanses us from sin. That's all. And all the water in the world couldn't wash one sin away. And nobody could be saved by baptism. That's a fallacy, and that's a false teaching. It's not Jesus plus something, like Jesus plus baptism or Jesus plus good works. It's Jesus. He's the Savior, and he doesn't take second billing to anybody. He doesn't share that glory with anybody. It's not Jesus plus something. It's just Jesus. That's one of the great things that uh, Martin Luther taught for back many, many years ago in the 1500s, he taught that. He said there was a battle going on because uh, the church in those days was teaching that they had to do works in order to be saved. And uh, he said, no, I can't find that in the Bible. The Bible says not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And it's not of, of baptism. It's not of church membership. It's not of sincerity. It's Jesus. Nail it down. Put your confidence and faith in Jesus alone. And, uh, and uh, we understand that, don't we? It, it, we're saved by grace. And we also understand that we don't keep ourselves saved. You understand that? Yeah. Uh, we're saved by grace and we're kept by the power of God. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're in the hand of Jesus, who's in the hand of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And the only way any saved soul could ever be lost is if God will lose his power, Jesus lose his power, the Holy Spirit lose his power, and the Bible's not true. It's the only way a saved soul could ever be lost. How many of you believe that God's going to die? Jesus is going to die again, lose his power. The Holy Spirit's going to lose his power. And yet there are some people who would fight you over this and say, well, I believe somewhere in the Bible, somewhere in there, it teaches that you've got to hold out faithful to the end or you won't be saved. Well, I can find you a verse that talks about the tribulation period, about people in the middle of the tribulation after the rapture of the church that have to hold out, who, who endure the end and are saved. But I don't see that for this time in which we live today. And you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. And the Bible is so very clear when he said you are kept by the power of God. You're not kept by your own power. 
If you could keep yourself saved, you wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. But you can't. And if you had to keep yourself saved, you'd be lost pretty quick because the devil is a little smarter than you are. A little stronger than you are. And if the devil could get one soul, he could get all of us. But we don't save ourselves and we don't keep ourselves saved. The Bible is so very clear on that matter. It should not be any clouded issue to anybody that believes the Bible. I quote it again. The Bible says in the words of Jesus, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. Now, there's some that say, no, Jesus lied about that. He just gives you life until you sin or life until you backslide. But that's not what the Bible says. That's, that's man's doctrine. That's not Jesus. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and uh, they shall follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, if anybody in the whole world could be saved or then lost, then Jesus was mistaken. Jesus taught a false doctrine. The Bible is not true. But if Jesus told the truth, and Jesus knew what he was talking about, he gives to his sheep eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. We're secure. We're kept by the power of God. I had somebody say to me, say, well, preacher, you could get yourself out of his hand. I said, you're bigger than Jesus. Why would you ever want to get yourself out of his hand? In the first place, that's pretty silly. But in the second place, you have to be bigger than he is if you have to knock yourself out of his hand when he said he's holding you. You don't hold on to him. He holds you. Get it down, folk. Don't trust yourself to save yourself. And don't trust yourself to keep yourself saved. It is Jesus who saves. It is Jesus who keeps you saved. Nail it. Hold it down. Believe what God said about it and forget what men say about it who will take a verse out here and a verse out here and try to prove a doctrine when the teaching of God's Word is absolutely spotlessly clear. Salvation is of the Lord and it's eternal salvation. There's no teaching of salvation for a part time. It's eternal. But now that you know that, it's possible for you to get a little bit loose and be guilty of presumptuous sins. Well, it's okay if I do this because I'm saved forever. And since I'm saved forever, uh, it won't matter if I do sin a little bit because I know I'm saved. And I know that I can go back to the Lord and confess it and get cleaned up and be restored to fellowship. I know that sin breaks fellowship with the Lord. It doesn't break relationship any more than when my boys and my daughter, when they disobeyed, they were still my children. And when a child of God is still his child, but he's a disobedient child. And the Lord spanks his children because they are his children. They don't lose their salvation. They don't lose that relationship, but they lose fellowship and you can lose fellowship with the Lord if you allow sin to get in your life. Just like my boys uh, and my daughter who got out of fellowship with me when they disobeyed Daddy. But they were still my children. You understand that? All right. Now, he said, we could be guilty of presumptuous sins. Well, I'm saved, so it won't matter if I do this or I do that. Because I'm saved. And uh, the Apostle Paul said, there may be some that say that we teach that. We're slanderously reported that we say that, but we've never taught that. And I don't know anybody in all of these years that I've ever heard say anything like that. 
But they accuse you of saying that, even though it's not true. We've never said that. No one ever said it. What we have said is you're a child of God. If you're disobedient, you can get chastened of the Lord. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you're no longer his child, then he wouldn't be spanking you as a son. Follow that? The Lord chastens his own. And it's, it's possible to be guilty of presumptuous sins. It's okay if I do a little bit wrong. I can get forgiveness. As one of the poets said, sin in haste, repent in leisure. But that's a wrong teaching. That's a wrong teaching. That's not Bible. And the psalmist said, Lord, Lord, keep me from presumptuous sins. Don't let them have dominion over me. I've got a warning here. The Lord spanks his children because they are his children. They are forever his children. They're forever in his family. But if they deliberately walk away, he will chasten his own because they are his own. There's not a person in this room that would be honest that would say they've never committed a presumptuous sin. Well, be honest about it. Think about it. You've committed a sin thinking, well, I'm saved. It's going to be okay. I can get by. I, I won't lose my salvation. You can't lose it. You didn't buy it. And you didn't work for it. It was a gift, and God's no Indian giver. He doesn't take it back. It's eternal life, not life until something happens. It's eternal. It's what he said. It's what God said. But you know what? There's not a single one here who's never thought, I know this is wrong, but I'll go ahead and do it, and I can confess it and get it right later. Shame on you. Shame on me. Shame on anybody. David knew it. And David said, Lord, keep me back from presumptuous sins. Let it not have dominion over me. Lord, help me not to ever think, since I'm saved, it doesn't matter. As again, if you read uh, Romans chapters uh, 6, 7, and 8, you'll see the same teaching here. And he said uh, that some say that we can sin and get by with it because we're children. He said, we've never taught anything. God forbid. How should we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's not what we teach at all. But he said, it's possible for us to bring ourselves to the place of the Lord's chastening. Lord, hold me back, keep me back, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. The great transgression, what is it? The great transgression is presumptuous sins. Sins that you think, well, since I'm saved, I can get by with it. I'll always be saved. Well, you'll always be saved, but you're going to come under the chastening of the Lord. If you're a disobedient child, the Heavenly Father will discipline his own child. You better be careful. You better be super careful. As we have read in 1 Corinthians, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and some have died. The Lord took them on to heaven because of their sin. They refused to get right with the Lord. Wouldn't it be an awful thing to die because of, we're so rebellious in our heart that we just wouldn't do right and the Lord just have to take us on to heaven because all of his chastening didn't work? Hold back thy servant. Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright in the way and all will be well. 
And then let's not only look at the, the uh, words uh, warning, but let's look at the words reward in verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Lord, I want to meditate on your word. I want to muse over it. I want to turn it over in my mind. I want to memorize it. I want to look at it from different angles. I want to accept the truth. And I'm going to just meditate on the words of the Lord. As I meditate on the words of the Lord, uh, then I'll be pleasing to him. And uh, Lord, I know you'll be pleased because that's acceptable with you. If I'm meditating on your word and living by it, let's pray.